for the North Region of the American Cancer Society and supports M Health Fairview and serves as the research liaison between ACS and the Hormel Institute and the Masonic Cancer Center. Um, thank you, Pam. We really appreciate it. I'll let you introduce Dr. Greer. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for, for being here today. I know you're going to find this workshop to be extremely helpful, and so I am honored to introduce you to Dr. Susanna Greer. Dr. Greer is the Senior Scientific Director of Biochemistry and Immunology at the American Cancer Society. Not only does she speak to donors and volunteers and researchers, she also oversees external partnerships, directs strategic planning and scientific review, and collaborates with, collaborates with our advocacy arm, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, to enhance advocacy efforts of scientists for cancer research. Dr. Greer received her PhD in immunology from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and was a postdoc fellow at the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Greer was recruited to Georgia State University as a Georgia Cancer Coalition Distinguished Cancer Scholar, where she was a tenured associate professor and director of the Center for the Molecular Basis of Disease. In 2012, she launched Greer Consulting, Science Speakeasy, a consulting firm based on facilitating communication between scientists and lay audience based on identification of shared goals, benefit analysis, and non-technical delivery. So thank you again, Dr. Greer, and thanks to um, Masonic Cancer Institute, um, Masonic Cancer Center, and the Hormel Institute for this opportunity. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Greer. Great. Thank you, Pam and Jessica, and thank you to the Cancer Center. I'm so excited to be here. Can everybody see my slides? Maybe, uh, Jessica, can you give me a thumbs up if everything's good to go? Okay, awesome. So um, one thing Pam didn't say, which I think is relevant to all of you, is that um, I've been in your shoes no matter where you are in this journey. So I ran a research lab for about 15 years and actually one of my first big grants came from the American Cancer Society. It was a research scholar grant. And then um, once I was a tenured professor, I was a reviewer for the American Cancer Society. I co-chaired a peer review committee and I've been a staff member for ACS for about five and a half years. So no matter where you sit on this spectrum of maybe applying for grants um, and being in that um, uh, really challenging place of, of thinking about funding and wondering about different organizations and which ones you should apply to, um, or if you have received funding, um, I, I've been there. Um, so the goal today is to do something that honestly I wish um, have been done for me when I was thinking about applying for the American Cancer Society grant. And that is that I wish that I knew more about the organization. It's extraordinarily difficult to apply for a grant when you're on the outside. So now it'd be super easy for me to apply for an ACS grant, right? Because I know so much about the ACS. So we're gonna take this in several steps. Um, I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time talking to you about the American Cancer Society and some resources that I think might be helpful. And then I'll spend some time just kind of explaining to you how we fund grants, what we fund, what we're looking for, and then kind of sharing some inside tips because I found, um, so I've seen at this point thousands of grants or thousands of applications, right? As a reviewer and as a staff member. And typically I see the same kind of first time mistakes over and over again. So I want to keep you from making those mistakes. Uh, you can make new mistakes, uh, but we're not gonna make the ones that everybody makes. Um, all right, so I, I can only see my screen. Um, so at the end, if you will have plenty of time for questions, the, work, the workshop itself will probably take a little bit less than an hour and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So if you wanna drop things in the Q&A, that's fine. If you just wanna uh, come off mute at the end, I think we can do that and we can take questions as well. Or if you have something that you're like, you know what, I really just wanna ask Susanna um, my emails at the very end and you can drop me an email. And uh, before I forget, Please don't um, make yourself crazy taking notes, um, unless that keeps you awake. I'll share my slides uh, with Pam and she can share them with the Cancer Center. So you'll have all this information. All right, so let's dive in. Okay, so let's see. Um, all right, so we'll talk about our research programs first. Um, 
one of the things that I think it's just super helpful to understand is that the American Cancer Society approaches research in three different ways. First of all, we're pretty similar to whatever the academic department that you sit in um, looks like, meaning that if you walked into my office, you'd feel really comfortable because um, we do research at the ACS. So we conduct research and then we also fund research. And then we have an advocacy arm called ACS CAN or the Cancer Action Network. So when I say you'd feel really comfortable is because when I'm at work back when I wasn't sitting in my home office, I'm surrounded by other MDs and PhDs and folks with master's degrees, and we are either focused on research that is happening at the ACS or the research that goes out into our extramural program. So we're structured very similar to the National Cancer Institute in that we have an intramural and extramural program. So I will spend barely any time talking about our intramural program just because I wanna focus on our extramural program because that's where all of you are going to be um, applying to the ACS. But I wanna at least introduce you to our intramural program because there are some resources on cancer.org uh, that would be, I think, exceptionally useful to you. That would have been really useful to me when I was um, a postdoc or a faculty member. Okay, so on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see research that we we conduct and most of that research, so we don't have wet labs at the ACS. So I'm an immunologist. I couldn't have worked at the ACS when I was running a lab, um, but we, we have um, the capability to perform large population studies and a lot of data science, which is the research that we conduct. So most of that is in epidemiology and surveillance and survivorship. And at the bottom, you can see that the goal is that we are trying to gain a better understanding of you know, why do we get cancer? Who gets cancer? How can we prevent it? And then in the middle is the research that we fund. And we'll spend all of our time today really talking about that. And I really want to help you understand that um, the ACS, I mean, honestly, if you remember nothing else that I say today, the probably the bottom line message is that if you are doing research that is related to oncology, we're interested in it. We don't fund in a particular area of cancer or a particular population group. We fund across the patient experience, meaning that everything that we fund, either our research inside the ACS or in our extramural program, impacts patients all the way from cancer prevention, right, which is the goal, to early detection and diagnosis, cutting edge treatment, survivorship, and palliative care. So we find, I call that the patient experience, right? How you interact with cancer. And then we find um, a, an incredibly broad um, portfolio within the 300 plus diseases that we call cancer. And then ACS CAN is pretty fabulous because it is our advocacy arm, so our sister organization that is advocating for a couple of things. Um, so increased funding for the NCI from the government, um, which is going to be important to all of our researchers because um, most of the grants that the ACS funds are not renewable. And we'll spend some time talking about today that we fund um, our most of our um, research dollars in the extramural program are focused on beginning investigators. And so that second and third and fourth and fifth grant you get is probably going to come from the NCI. So we want the NCI to have a robust budget. And then ACS CAN is also going to advocate for implementation of policies that can help all of us, right, to reduce the mortality in our, uh, from cancer and our risk from cancer. And a lot of that advocacy work comes from the work that happens in our extramural program, right, um, the, the observations that we make and publish, and then in our intramural program. So an example might be a smoking cessation um, work, right, if we knew that your your town had a smoking cessation policy that was or a law that was being voted on, ACS CAN would want to get behind that. Okay, so again, we have, this is our cancer research continuum. So in the kind of gray color is data science, and that is um, part of kind of half of when I think about the two departments uh, where we fund research at the ACS. And um, data science is going to be tasked with really 
um, analyzing and disseminating um, an enormous amount of cancer statistics. Now, the reason that I kept this on this slide is because I wanted you to be aware, if you aren't already, that the ACS provides all of the information that our data science team um, evaluates um, free of charge. And so they're all on our website. They're on cancer.org. You've probably heard of the facts and figures um, policies and um, or the facts and figures publications, and those are all, um, so we have cancer facts and figures that comes out every year that we publish. It is the most widely cited cancer statistics um, in the world. And then we also have um, more specific journals that are in like breast cancer and colorectal cancer or uh, cancers in Latinos and um, African-Americans. So take a look at these resources. Data Science also publishes some really cool um, statistics on, so you can look to see how, what are the breast cancer um, mortality rates in your town and how does that compare to the town next door? And so I think that, um, anyways, a lot of this information would have been invaluable to me when I was working on grants and publications. So take a look, it's all on cancer.org. If you can't find it, drop me an email. Okay, the second um, bullet is our population, describes our population science, which is the other arm of our intramural program. So again, the research that happens at the ACS. So in population science, these are the largest um, population studies or cancer prevention studies um, that occur in the world. We're on our third one. They have not very exciting names of CPS, <laughs> cancer prevention studies, uh, one, two, and three, and we're on our third one now. Um, so you've if you haven't heard of them, you've benefited from them. So cancer prevention study one, for example, was the first um, study that was able to link smoking to lung cancer. So anytime you ever hear someone from the American Cancer Society, like maybe giving congressional testimony and they say, according to the American Cancer Society, blah, blah, that comes from our population science data. Um, cancer prevention study three is really unique because it actually enrolled um, a, a little less than half a million healthy individuals. Um, and these individuals are really incredible volunteers because they give, uh, they fill out an extensive questionnaire when they sign up for the cancer prevention study, they give blood samples, and then we follow them for their, uh, for the remainder of their life. And then we, um, so uh, this is a retrospective study that will allow us to say, you know, what were the risk of where you lived and what you did and you know what you were exposed to. So you're exposed on um, to developing cancer. Okay, so that's it on intramural. So I feel bad because I'm not going to have time to talk about much of my the work of my colleagues. But again, all of this data and all of their work is on cancer.org. And um, I'll mention just a little bit about uh, population science again when we talk about opportunities for collaboration. All right, so we're gonna talk about extramural science, which is in pink at the bottom, and that's research that we find. And that is where we are funding um, truly outstanding science. And that is science that spans the scientific spectrum. So not only does it span the patient spectrum, right? So where you, a patient might interact with cancer, and also many, many, many of the types of cancers that we could come into contact with as a patient, but also we're gonna fund across the scientific spectrum. So we're gonna fund discovery research or basic science, translational and clinical research. And if you were just to take a picture of our portfolios, about 45, I mean, it depends on the year, but um, about 45% of what we fund, I would say is truly basic or developmental science. Um, we use a really competitive, and I think, um, of course, I'm extraordinarily biased, but I think we, our peer review system um, is uh, in, uncomparable. And part of that is because when folks in review for the American Cancer Society, they are they feel like they are mentoring and giving back to that next generation of science because uh, we focus a lot of our funding on young investigators. Um, I know I really enjoyed being a reviewer for the ACS. I mean, it's hard work, um, but I also reviewed for the NIH and DOD and other organizations. And at ACS, you feel like you actually have an opportunity to help. So uh, later in our conversation, uh, one of the things I'll ask you to keep in mind is that when you get those reviews back from, and, and you aren't exactly excited about them, uh, remember that these folks are giving their time, their effort, their volunteers, and they really do want to help uh, make um, the science better. Okay, so um, 
in extramural science, so what do we do? So we have funded over $5 billion in research now since the 1940s. Um, and a couple of things we're proud about are that um, this typically is the first major grant for young researchers. And I, I get questions all the time about why does the ACS focus on um, early stage or beginning investigators? And the reason is we're a nonprofit, so we can't do everything. And we find that it is still um, challenging for new investigators to launch their careers. Um, actually, in 2021, we will launch a new program that is uh, directed towards mid-career investigators. But honestly, I mean, I, I am super excited for folks who to do research on arthritis and Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis, but I work for the American Cancer Society and we want the most outstanding scientists to do cancer research, right? We want their research to be applied to oncology and the best time to catch folks is early in their career. Um, we are proud of the fact that historically about 50% of our grants have gone to female researchers and we have some work to do in this space and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, but I think we're doing an okay job there. Okay, so we currently have 737 grants funded nationwide for a total investment of uh, 419 million, and you can see how those um, spread out across the country. Um, and you guys are doing pretty good. So if we look at uh, Minnesota, and we can um, take maybe a quicker look here, a little bit more in depth. I just put this up because I thought this was super interesting. So when we think about what is our funding history at the University of Minnesota, one of our first grants uh, to your university um, was um, in a ovarian was in ovarian cancer. So in um, well, I should say overall, since 1946, um, we have funded uh, 550 American Cancer Society grants totaling over $61 million. Um, and you guys have been extraordinarily productive. You've uh, published 303 uh, peer reviewed publications where you cited ACS funding. So this is kind of cool. The first ACS grantee at the University of Minnesota was Dr. Alfred um, Near, and his work um, was in, um, so a, a lot of his work um, was in imaging, and um, I thought this was incredibly interesting that they helped to develop, um, you know, uh, instrumentation that is useful for tracer work um, and useful for tracer isotypes. And so it's exciting to think about um, that being, you know, one of the first grants that we funded. Um, currently, we have 12 grants um, totaling a little bit over $6 million at the University of Minnesota. And you can see there's a huge range all the way from Dr. Zuhar Sachs grant um, that's in uh, leukemia cell, uh, stem cell persistence in AML, um, all the way down to Rachel Vogel's grant, um, looking at a wearable device intervention, um, thinking about melanoma and our behaviors around melanoma. So I pulled up just one of the things that we ask grantees um, are, well, we interview them and interact with them all the time, but um, one of the, the things that we typically ask grantees is how has ACS um, funding impacted you? How has it impacted cancer, cancer research, your career? So. Uh, Dr. Sarah Gallus had a, a grant that uh, recently ended at the ACS, um, and her grant focused on um, the effects of media controversies on public attitudes about um, cancer prevention. Um, and so the what I wanted to highlight for you, again, you'll have these slides, so you can go back and read any of this that you want to later, but uh, one of the things that Sarah said um, when my team asked her about how this grant impacted her career was, she said, this grant had an enormous impact on my career, contributing towards opportunities, not only for myself, but for the pipeline of future researchers undertaking social and behavioral research as it relates to cancer prevention. And I can certainly relate to that because when I had ACS funding, that meant that all the grad students and postdocs in my lab, um, you know, their research, again, I'm an immunologist and some of our research was on autoimmune disease. And because of ACS funding, a lot of our research uh, moved toward the oncology space. Um, one of the things, this is a shameless plug, I'll mention at the end, is if you'd like to know more about the research that we fund, because I do think it's really helpful to get an idea of when you're thinking about submitting a grant of what an organization is investing in. Um, one thing you can do is go to cancer.org and you can find by state or by disease um, the types of research we're funding. You can read lay abstract summaries. Another thing you can do is we have a research podcast called Theory Lab. It's available anywhere you listen to um, podcasts. Um, and so 
You can find that on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, just um, type in Theory Lab. It's a shameless plug because I host the podcast and um, it's a really a fun way to learn about lots of different types of research that we're investing in. And we've been um, producing the podcast for about two years. So lots of data there. Okay. I also want to just quickly highlight um, Dr. Aaron Goldstrom, who also had an ACS grant. And um, the reason that I wanted to highlight what Aaron's comment was is that Aaron shared at the bottom here that a positive impact on his career was in the grant review process. And so just so that you wouldn't just have to believe me, <laughs> I think our peer review is pretty good. Um, Aaron says that at the bottom, unlike other agencies, the ACS review panel strive to provide constructive feedback and suggestions for improvement. And it helps applicants such as myself improve their research plan, grant writing skills, and lead to better science. Um, and so when you are thinking about writing your ACS grant or when you're thinking about where you're gonna submit, um, one of the questions you may have for me is when should I submit my grant? And honestly, I think you should submit your grant when you have enough data that you're ready to get feedback. You, you may know because of some things that I share with you today that the likelihood of you getting funded during that first submission because of maybe some piece that you're missing, is unlikely, but you're gonna get some really good feedback. So when you have enough preliminary data that you want to hear that um, kind of assessment of your ideas and get some feedback, I think is a great time to submit that grant because hopefully, not always because reviewers are human, but hopefully um, you'll have a really positive review, ex review experience with us. And if you don't, you can let me know. Okay, the final little grant I wanted to highlight is Melissa Geller. Um, and again, the, this is just a different type of grant, natural killer cell immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. And I just wanted to um, say that if you, are, if you are a practicing physician, we also have a goal at the ACS of really helping physician scientists to make that transition from training to running also a research lab and seeing patients because that is a huge lift. Um, and so we have a specific grant mechanism that's for um, individuals who are actively seeing patients. And I think that that can help um, our physician scientists to really continue um, in their careers and then compete successfully for additional funding. So you can go back and listen to Melissa's comments if you like, um, she's pretty exceptional. Okay, um, so the last thing that I wanted to share with you kind of just in a, a big picture space, are our research priorities? Because I get lots of questions about, well, does my research fit? How will I know, et cetera, et cetera. And I will say this is an evolving process, um, much you know, like most funding or organizations, um, we will have different priorities that change over time, but um, wanted you to think about, you know, kind of what's happening in 2021. So one of the things that you can do when you want to think about what types of research is the American Cancer Society funding um, is that you can read a publication that came out um, just a couple of weeks ago in CA, and that is, um, let's see, I think it's the titles on the next slide. Yeah, so here's the link here. You can find it. Um, it's a blueprint for cancer research. So one of the questions that we had in 2020 is how can we really assess what the scientific community sees as our most vital needs. Because one thing I'll tell you that we don't do at the ACS is that I don't decide what we should be funding, right? We think that the biggest challenges come from the field. You guys are on the front lines and you know where um, your biggest potential for impact is. So one of the things that we did last year was we interviewed almost a hundred experts from across the disease spectrum and really ask them, you know, what are your biggest challenges and what are your biggest, what are the biggest opportunities and publish this blueprint um, so that we could think about, and we did focus on, it, the article is not organized by disease, but we focused on asking questions among the top 20 cancer, um, cancers that cause death in the United States and um, childhood cancers. And so um, you may be like, well, Susanna, that's all well and good that we can go read this article and see what are the biggest challenges and opportunities as the ACS sees them, but what are you really funding? Okay, so this is the data and this is from 2019. I don't have the data from 2020 yet. And this data actually comes from you. So when you apply for a grant from the American Cancer Society, 
um, you are asked to say, um, my research is 20% related to prostate cancer and 80% related to colorectal, or my research is 100% related to lung cancer, or my research is actually related to all cancers. And that might be where you sit if you're in you know, some really pretty basic science area. So based on our applications that we received in 2019, our funding um, looks like this. So you can see that 20% of our applicants who were eventually awarded grants to the ACS said that their research applied to all cancers. Um, 14%, so the largest, um, the largest um, investment was in breast cancer as far as individual cancers, and after that would have been lung, and then you can see we have a huge investment where this other is in all of those various different cancers um, that, you know, may not be the um, you know, that's where all of your um, cancers are going to fall out, where we see the um, impact being less, um, but, but the interest being strong from the ACS. So I just show this to hopefully prove to you um, that we really are interested in funding across the cancer spectrum. Okay. So um, this is a slide that it is, um, has a lot of information on it. And so this is one you're going to want to go back and look at um, after the talk, but I, I wanted to share this with you because it relates to that cancer blueprint um, and it relates to when the ACS, when we think about what are we going to fund, we have a series of priorities, research priorities. So my uh, department sits in the Office of Cancer Research and Implementation, so it's OCRI. So we have research priorities that align with the ACS mission priorities. So these research priorities are on the right-hand side. So we're not going to go through all of these, but I would be willing to bet that what you do, you can find under these priorities. They are broad by necessity. Um, and some years we may say, we are super interested in, let's say the first one, metabolism and nutrition and physical activity. And some years we might say, we are really interested in metastasis, um, but, but these are gonna be the priorities that your research is gonna need to fall under. Okay, so how do we assess your grants when they are your applications when they're submitted? So we have three broad programs at the ACS. Um, the first is the program that I direct and that's the program in biochemistry and immunology of cancer. And under that program, we have peer review committees and you can see how those peer review committees link to these research priorities. So for instance, we'll just take the first one, DNA mechanisms in cancer is going to um, look at about three different areas. And if you look at the very bottom, I mean, we're interested in those somatic molecular behavioral and you know, causes of cancer, um, incidence, progression, and mortality. So I, I am highlighting these to say, um, read them and understand that this is how we evaluate um, at the end of the day what we're funding and is the research that we're funding uh, um, appropriately moving the bar on the mission of the ACS. Um, we also have a, so this is the most basic program. The more, as we move kind of to the right, when we think about more um, translational science, we have the program in cell biology and preclinical cancer research. And again, four peer review committees, cancer cell biology, uh, metastasis and the microenvironment, and you can see them, and then you can go back and link to what they're going to review. And then finally, our most clinical program is called clinical cancer control research. And again, you can see the peer review committees here. Now, something else I wanted to highlight for you is that the American Cancer Society has a longstanding interest in health equity research. Um, this is an area where we have excelled for the past two decades, and we continue to be um, a leader in this place. And I'll share a little bit about what we're doing. And health equity research is really going to span um, all of these research priorities. And then we also have a program called Mission Boost Grants. Um, Mission Boost Grants are a little different. They are... Um, similar to an SBIR, if you're familiar with that mechanism from the National Institutes of Health, where the ACS is reinvesting in our scientists who have been funded by the ACS and are now willing to take their pretty 
basic or developmental science to that translational and eventually to that clinical space. So this just is an opportunity for what the ACS sees as eventual commercialization and obviously clinical trial and patient impact for research. And so we are hoping that we can move uh, many of our researchers down this pipeline. Um, but it's, it's why we remain so interested in discovery science because we know that that pipeline is absolutely essential to patient impact. Okay, all right. So. One of the things I've said six times is that the ACS focuses its research on young investigators. So why would we do that? Well, one of the reasons I said is we wanna capture all of you who are so awesome <laughs> in the oncology space and we want you to stay here. Um, but we also know there is a void um, in funding for young investigators. So this slide shows um, in blue, um, by year, so on the, the y-axis is absolute so total number of grants, um, and the x-axis is year. And in blue, you can see these are the total number of research scholar grants funded by the American Cancer Society. And we'll talk about research scholar grants in a few minutes, um, but these are grants that are similar to R01 mechanisms. They're a little smaller. They're about $800,000 grants. Um, but they are the most similar kind of mechanisms that we have to the R01. In red, you can see NCI funding of first time R01s. So here to me is what is pretty significant about why the ACS should continue this emphasis in funding early stage investigators. And that is, so if you look at, so I can't, um, my own big head is blocking this for me, but I can see up to 2016. So in 2016, you can see that the NCI funded 158 first time R01s, while the ACS funded 79 research scholar grants. Um, now, that should be more significant to you because our budget in 2016 was about 1 60th that of the NCI. So with a much smaller budget, the ACS is making a big impact in funding early stage investigators. Um, so let's see, the next thing I wanted to highlight was how are these researchers doing? Because this is really important. So one of the things that we ask ourselves is, that's great that we're funding these new awards and that a, a, a substantial number of first time investigators in the oncology space are funded by the ACS, but how do they do? Because again, we generally fund one time, although we do have additional mechanisms like that mission boost grant to continue your funding, but you're going to need, if you want to be successful in this academic space, you're going to need to um, eventually get an R level grant from the NCI or from another um, NIH um, institute. Okay, so if you look at, um, so what this graph shows with that long introduction is that um, we follow our uh, funded grantees, we follow them in all kinds of ways, but one of the things that we do is that from the year that you are funded, we look to see within 10 years, have you gone on to receive our level funding um, from the NIH? And so the most recent data, of course, that we have is from 2010, because those uh, the, that would be data actually for our 2020 cohort. So by 2020, what this data shows is that um, over about, well, about 75% of ACS research scholar grant recipients received our level funding. So this to me is probably the most significant data that I have to show you that our peer review works, that we're making the right decisions, we are funding the right investigators, um, because they are being incredibly successful. Uh, this is also data that um, our grantees can use when they go up for tenure uh, to say, listen, this research scholar grant is really gonna help me and statistically speaking, gonna help leverage me to the next point in my career. Um, the other thing about this data is that we weighted it against ourselves. So this doesn't take into account a research scholar grant recipient who maybe stayed in oncology, but went to work in biotech or went to work for pharma or became a, an advocate for cancer or uh, became a science writer. So uh, these are actually folks who went on to receive R01. So this is pretty amazing data. Okay. All right, so one of the things I wanted to leave you with, and then we're just gonna talk about a few um, mechanisms, specific funding mechanisms that I think are relevant to the group that's assembled today is equity. So how are we doing in this space? And I think there's good news and bad news here. Okay, so 
some of the bad news, um, none of this probably comes as a surprise to anyone who's listening. If it does, I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> so women in academia in the United States are less likely to mis- receive uh, tenure than their male counterparts. They are more likely to hold lower ranking positions. Um, they turn, tend to earn less than men at all academic ranks. And this one is specifically um, striking to me that if they are married with children, they are less likely than married cho- married men with children to obtain tenure track positions. This came um, from a study in the Lancet, but there's unfortunately plenty of other data to back this up. Okay, so one place that I think we're doing an okay job is here. Um, and that is that our gender breakdown um, looks pretty equitable. So if you look overall from 2009 to 2018, so we took a 10 year kind of snapshot Um, We had 47% of our applicants were female and 51% of our grantees. Um, So you can see this, uh, this is a complicated slide. So we'll just start over here with 2009. So you can see that we had 936 applications from men, 796 applications from women. We funded 130 grants to women, uh, to men. We funded um, 164 grants to women. So in 2009, that left us with an overall success rate of 20% for women and 14% for men. And you can see those numbers are, reasonably similar across the board. So I think that's good news. Um, At least it shows that we do have equity um, when we are undergoing evaluation of grants. So over those 10 years, um, we have done well in funding women. Um, Right now, about 49% of our grantees um, are women one of the numbers that concerns me is that they over only receive about 40% of the overall funding investment. Now that's not because I know at some other organizations there's been issues with women getting smaller grants, like smaller budgets. So at the ACS, um, the budget is set for everyone. One of the challenges though that we have at the ACS is that we do have more women applying for like postdoctoral fellowships than some of our larger grants, like the Research Scholar Grant. Um, so, One of the things that we need to do is that while we have an overall good success rate um, for women, in fact, it's higher, I think, in every year than for men, we need to encourage more women to apply for these larger grants. It's a pipeline issue. So there is a disparity in how many women apply for research scholar grants, our research professor and our clinical research professor award. But once they apply, they are incredibly competitive. Um, So. To me, it's a pipeline and an application issue. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is what are the barriers to women applying for these grants? Um, But I do think there's some progress. um, And we actually have a brand new, what I think is probably the best parental leave policy for postdoctoral fellows um, in the country, as far as I know. Um, This is parental leave. This isn't just for women. But if you adopt, foster, or have, add a child to your life uh, during your postdoctoral fellowship, we will pay from four to to 12 weeks, a minimum of four weeks, a maximum of 12 weeks of leave where you can be spending time learning how to be a new parent um, away from the lab. That's a requirement. You have to be away from the lab. And then we will also extend the postdoctoral fellowship by that amount of time so that the time that was spent away from the lab can be made up and you will have the full um, experience of the grant. Uh, That just went into effect in January of this year. And as I said, I think it's the best policy in the country. Okay, Um, another striking concern is the lack of diversity in health sciences and biomedical research. Again, this will come as a surprise to no one in this room. If it does, glad you're here. Um, We know that um, many minority groups, including African-Americans, Alaskan Natives, Hispanics, and Hawaiians, and other Pacific Pacific Islanders are are, um, strikingly underrepresented. Um, and health-related sciences. Um, There is a racial gap um, in in NIH R01 funding, um, and it is a different challenge at the ACS, but but this is a challenge for all of science. Um, So at the the NIH, Black and African-American applicants um, are 10 percentage points less likely than white applicants to be awarded IR1 funding. At ACS, our application, again, the success rate is equitable. 
What is not equitable is how many um, underrepresented minorities are applying. So um, as you can see, these numbers are really small and the numbers of applications that we're getting. So um, underrepresented minorities only made up 6% of our applicants. Um, and that was looking at Black and African-American, Hispanic and Latino, 3%. So a huge pipeline challenge. And so we have a number of um, programs that we are putting into place to, to help here. It's not gonna solve this situation at all. Um, we have a ways to go, but I'll, I'll at least share a couple of them. So we have a diversity and cancer research program that's been ongoing, but we are expanding it um, to really think about um, the workforce. So I told you that for 20 years, um, we have funded research that is in health equity. Um, so now we are really focusing on, on workforce. Why, why do we have so few applicants for these grants? So we have a diversity and cancer research program. We are currently launching, launching diversity and cancer research un, um, internships. These are for undergraduate students. This is actually a fully funded program that we hope will fund, should fund a thousand of these internships over the next 10 years. Um, we will start in 2021 diversity and cancer research institutional research grants, and we will also begin to integrate with um, the ACS intramural side in the population science and thinking about their disparities cohort. So stay tuned to that. Um, if this is an area of interest for you, please email me and I can get you in touch with the right folks. Um, but one of the messages that I wanted to share is that, you know, we have to have an inclusive um, research workforce. If we don't, we are losing out on so many creative and innovative people um, to help us accomplish our mission. So uh, just know the ACS 100% um, um, thinks that equity is incredibly important, both in diversity, um, both from um, a, a side when we're thinking about uh, racial groups and gender. Okay, so why should you apply? All right, well, the bad news is cancer is gonna impact all of us. Um, the great news is that we really do help you at the ACS translate whatever you're doing um, in your research space into impact. So I really wanna focus on um, some of the opportunities that all of you might be interested in. Um, you know, we, we have funded an awful lot of successful people, and I'd really like to add your names to this list of Nobel laureates that we funded, cancer center directors. I mean, these are big numbers, um, and there's no reason you can't be a part of that. Okay, so this is a breakdown of looking at our 2019 funding, sorry. Um, and I wanted to show you that um, in a typical year, um, about 70% of our funding has gone to research scholar grants. Um, so we'll talk about some of these other mechanisms, um, but this is where we put the biggest bang for our buck is in this large grant. And so we'll talk about it first. Again, I put this slide in just for your reference so you can go back and look at it later. Um, but this slide outlines um, the grant mechanisms that I thought would be most interesting to this group. We, we, we fund lots of grants at the ACS, but this one I think, our, or this group of four is probably gonna be the most interesting for you. So um, postdoctoral fellowships gives you the eligibility, the term, the award, and what's the percent effort for a postdoctoral fellowship, a clinician scientist development grant, a research scholar grant, and um, an internal, um, sorry, an institutional research grant gives you the submission dates. So um, maybe if you work in the grants office, you can print this off and put this on your wall. We'd love to have more of these grants in every category from um, your university. Okay, so we're not gonna, I'm not going to, when I talk about these grants, divide them by program because each of these programs, so remember I direct this program in green, the biochemistry immunology of cancer is the most basic program at the ACS. But each of our programs, this basic program, the translational clinical program, we all review each of these grants um, within these programs. And so um, where it becomes more important, um, as you begin to refine your application is to um, really look online, look at the type of research that we funded, look at that slide where I showed you how the, these different programs um, align with our research priorities and then think about where your grant will fit the best. But there are really in-depth descriptions of these peer review committees online. So we're not gonna spend any time talking about that. What I am going to spend probably about the next 15 minutes talking about are these different mechanisms. All right, so let's start with research scholar grants. So these research scholar grants, remember, are pretty similar to an R01. 
Um, the eligibility has been extended. So you can be a PI for, or you can have your um, independent research position. So your assistant professor position for up to eight years. If you're actively seeing patients that actually gets extended to 10 years and still be eligible for the research scholar grant. The initial award is for four years. Um, generally, you can be eligible for a one year no cost extension. And that's um, the award is up to $200,000 plus 20% indirect cost. Okay, so when reviewers are looking at your resource scholar grant, and here are some of kind of the first time mistakes that I see folks making. One is that um, I would encourage you for sure to, if you are submitting grants to the NCI, or to, for example, leukemia and lymphoma, absolutely co-submit to lots of organizations, but you really do have to tweak it. I mean, this goes without saying, but you have to tweak it for a nonprofit. And one of the things that you may not think about, I mean, that should be obvious. You can't submit the exact same grant. One of the things that may not be obvious is why. And one of the reasons why is that, so the NCI has hundreds of peer review committees. The ACS has about 16. So you in your peer review committee, while I can 100% guarantee you that the right expert will be reviewing your grant, the right experts, there'll be two. Uh, there, I can also 100% guarantee you there will be lots of people in the room who don't do what you do. And you need to convince them that what you do um, is important and how um, your research will move the field forward. And so it's a, it's a pretty easy problem to solve, but it requires some really elegant grantsmanship where you write a broad introductory paragraph. It doesn't need to be a page. It certainly doesn't need to be six, but a paragraph that helps explain why your research is so exciting, innovative, necessary, how it fits into the field and how it moves the field forward. And incredibly important, why should you be the one doing it, right? What, what is so essential and special about you that um, is, is really going to, so you're gonna lay out this beautiful rationale and then um, why you? So one of the things just to be aware of when you're thinking about this research scholar grant is that you're gonna be um, judged on multiple things. So you're gonna be judged on your past accomplishments. So for a research scholar grant, let's say you're in the middle of that eligibility. You've been a PI for about four years, um, an assistant professor, and, and then you have, so you have that track record and then you also have your track record as a postdoc. So you will be judged on all of that, right? So there are a few things really to think about. Um, in my mind, the, the criticisms that I see most for these grants are, um, that this person is not independent from their postdoc advisor, meaning that your research aligns too closely with the person or persons that you trained with. Um, so that and an example of this that a reviewer could use against you would be that if every paper you have in your independent position, your postdoc or what postdoctoral advisor is a co-author on. So that's not great. You, um, because a reviewer could say, the only reason these papers are being accepted is because um, their mentor, who is an esteemed scientist, is, an, is a co-author. So this is the time to separate yourself. You can also separate yourself, of course, by having some really lovely letters from your advisor showing that while they are supportive of you, you are completely independent. Um, the second one is hard, uh, but there are lots of really cool ways to approach it. So do you show you're becoming a leader in the field? So to me, um, one of the things I'll tell you that I think it's not set in stone, but in the, in the time that I have been, um, a director at ACS and when I was a reviewer and chairing a peer review committee, I have never seen a research scholar grant funded where the applicant didn't have a senior author paper. So a corresponding author paper. So that's the first thing that you need to do. And that's way back in the beginning when I said, when do you submit your grant? You have three opportunities to submit this grant. So if you don't have a senior author paper, but you have a lot of data, that might be the time to submit it to get some good feedback, but knowing that you may be lacking one of the things the reviewer is looking for. Now there is, it is absolutely not required for you to have that senior author paper. But what reviewers are looking for is that you are becoming a leader. And that corresponding author paper really shows that you are getting recognition from your peers. You are getting the, um, 
you're developing as a PI and you understand what a publishable unit is, you know how to lead a project, you know how to lead people, you know how to manage budgets, all the things that quite frankly, we don't really learn as postdocs, but are essential to our success as uh, PI. So that corresponding author paper turns out to be really important. Now, co-authorships are great too, because they, quite frankly, they show you're not a jerk, right? They show you can collaborate and work well with others and that you're reaching out into your university and beyond to establish yourself. And so I think corresponding author papers are critical, one. Um, and we can talk if you have questions later about um, timing on that, I'd be happy to, but, um, but absolutely get those papers out there. But what are other ways that that's kind of like, duh, what are other ways that you can show you're becoming a leader? Well, we are the American Cancer Society. So if you're not presenting at cancer meetings, you need to, right? You need to take your work and present it at AACR and get feedback from folks in the cancer community. Because even if you are a very basic scientist, that will help you um, to see how your research can move along that translational pipeline in oncology and who you might collaborate with to make that happen or who, where you might be publishing to make your research available to folks who can help move it along that pipeline. You can certainly, so and this has been a really awful year for everyone. Um, so if you have presented in online conferences, if your postdocs or grad students or undergrads have, all of those things show that you were becoming a leader in the field. Um, so tell the reviewers those things, have them on your CV. Same thing for do you show you're building a team? So do you show that? So uh, one of the like catch 22s I think of funding is, well, I can't hire a postdoc without money. Well, you can build true. Right. If you don't have a ton of startup, it may be hard to hire a postdoc. You might have a couple of grad students or undergrads in your lab, but you can build a team in other ways. And that's by the individuals who are at your institution who ought to be interested in and excited about what you're doing. And show, so you can show that you are collaborating with other individuals at your institution, um, that you're not just waiting to collaborate once you get this money, but that you're already reaching out, interacting, going to each other's lab meetings. Um, you have some preliminary data and you are super excited about this project. And of course they would need to show all those same things too in their letters. The final thing is institutional support. I, I cannot underline this enough. And that is that the ACS is a nonprofit. We do not have enough money to invest in every scientist that we would like to. And so sometimes we have to make really awful decisions. Some of those awful decisions can be comparing two candidates that look essentially identical and they are both wonderful. The one that I would pick if, if I had to make that choice would be the one that the institution has already said, this person is outstanding. And they show that not only this person is outstanding, but we think this person's going to be successful. And we show that by giving them startup. We show that by giving them teaching release. We show that by giving them enough lab space and animal space and all the things that they need. And then I, as a chair, have taken the time to write that down and to show how I am mentoring them. I am providing a supportive environment. I mean, all those things. I cannot tell you how important they are. And your reviewers will pick apart those letters of support from your institutions. So um, this, you are at an amazing place. So you should be able to knock this out of the park. So just make sure that that stone doesn't go unturned. Okay, so just a few other things. One is comprehensive knowledge and that, do you show comprehensive knowledge of the field? And that is, so could your ideas be considered incremental? And, and that goes back to that study section. So at ACS, you may have somebody who um, is reviewing your grant, who is an absolutely right on top of you, right on top of you in the field. But you may have somebody on the peer review committee whose research is um, maybe one signal transduction pathway over. And if you don't mention it at all, that's kind of annoying, right? So you need to show that you understand how your research fits into the, to the bigger picture of your field. Um, and again, we fund about 45% of what we do is um, basic science, but even our most basic scientists have to show that their research in five years or 10 years or 50 years can impact a patient, has the potential to do that. So that has to be in your grant. Um, and then some of it's just grantsmanship, right? This is, these last three things are grantsmanship. And that is, um, 
that remember these ACS reviewers are really gonna try to mentor you and to help your science improve. And so they wanna know that if you're wrong about most of this, do you have some alternative approaches? Um, they will go into areas of your grant wherever you invite them. I have seen reviews of grants fall apart over what I think is probably a typo where someone said, we're gonna use a thousand mice and they maybe meant 10. Um, but again, if you're being compared to someone else who has applied, who is in all other circumstances equal to you, and you made a careless mistake in your budget, the reviewer can say, well, do they, do they really have, do they put the time and effort and energy into putting forth a great grant application? Do they know how much it costs to run animal experiments? Do they know how much this core facility costs, right? All these things. Um, so just, know that your reviewers are gonna get into the weeds of everything and especially where they find mistakes. They're really gonna dig in there. So just consider what you write um, really carefully. And the last thing is just every element of your grant should be in sync. So by this, I mean that if you were to say, you know, I'm super excited about collaborating with Dr. Greer. She's gonna provide X, Y, and Z re reagent for us. Um, and X, Y, and Z animal model. And then if I were to write you a letter of support and mention none of that, that doesn't look great, <laughs> right? So everything has to be 100% in sync. Your reviewers are gonna take a lot of time with your grant. Um, so just make sure that you don't give them anything obvious to get fussy about. Okay, I wanna talk about clinician scientist development grants. The reason there's two circles here is that these grants used to be called mentored research uh, scholar grants. Um, and they, but the name changed last year to Clinician Scientist Development Grant. So in 2019, um, it's about 10 or 11% of our budget, which is true for about every year. Okay, these grants are different, right? These grants are grants that are intended to enable clinician scientists um, to focus on research. So to have dedicated time. It requires a 50% um, dedicated time. The budget's $135,000 a year um, and um, the grant can be up to five years. And so we really want to help these junior faculty. Um, this is a, unfortunately, a dwindling, dwindling population um, of physician scientists. Um, and we want to preserve um, uh, these folks because they provide some um, incredibly unique research. Okay, so what are the critical elements? So everything I said for the Research Scholar Grant applies here, but there is one other section. So with a caveat that we don't expect or there's not the same level of expectation from reviewers on publication. So a clinician scientist may have not done a postdoc. They um, may have had limited time in the lab. And so they may not have um, those uh, corresponding author publications. They should certainly be published and show that they have the capacity to do this research, um, but um, a little bit less of an emphasis on productivity. So, and that's simply because of the time spent in clinical training. So the part that is different here is that there is the inclusion of a mentoring plan. And the mentoring plan is gonna be pretty similar to the mentoring plan that you would include if you were writing a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, so the critical things to think about is, um, did I choose the right person basically? Have I chosen a mentor who will help to write a development plan that is absolutely specific to me, right? This can't be generic. This has to show how um, Susanna Greer is gonna move through this training and either through classes or experiences or collaboration, develop the expertise that I need to be independent and to be competitive for a research scholar grant and an R01 at the end of this funding period. Um, but it should be honest, right? It should be recognized what are the deficiencies that I've had. So, um, you know, maybe I didn't have any, uh, maybe biostatistics is a real deficiency for me. So how are we gonna fix that? What experiences will I have during this um, fellowship to help me grow in that area? And then how is this mentor and mentoring team is, is highly appropriate going to help um, me to, progress and how, again, is the institution gonna invest in this applicant um, in time, effort, and opportunity um, in this fellowship. Okay, last thing I wanna mention are postdoctoral fellowships. On average, they make up about 10% of our funding. We fund a ton of postdocs, they're just smaller grants. 
Um, so they are quite different, right? This is a training grant. Um, these are for new PhDs who can have up to four years of postdoctoral fellowship experience. The awards are for two to three years. And we have, um, thanks to my colleague, Dr. Nicole Lepanik, some really beautiful eligibility um, charts on cancer.org, which you can use to see if you are eligible for any of these grants, but we'll help walk you through um, the eligibility from some of the more complicated eligibility uh, scenarios, which I think are the clinician scientist grant and the postdoc. So it's a progressive stipend. One difference here is that these grants can only be resubmitted one time. So really the one thing I wanted to say, if you remember nothing else about a postdoctoral fellowship application to the ACS, one thing to think about is that they are going to be evaluated quite differently for the clinician scientist grant and the research scholar grant, and honestly, almost any other application we have, we are really interested in the research plan. Um, we are obviously interested in the researcher <laughs> as well for these grants, but for the postdoctoral fellowship, there are four areas that you will be evaluated in, and they are all equally weighted. So the first is going to be you. Um, so that's really no different than the other grants, but the weight here is, um, is higher. So we want to know how, um, what have you been up to? What did you do as a grad student? And if you've been a postdoc for a while, what have you done as a postdoctoral fellow? So I cannot underline enough how important reference letters are here. They are absolutely critical. Um, so I, a good reference letter can knock it out of the park and a bad one can absolutely tank an application. So just make sure the people who are writing you letters are invested in you and your success. Um, these reference letters should show what you did in grad school, what you've done as a postdoc, why you're a really good fit for the ACS award. Uh, this is a prestigious fellowship and um, should show that you were truly motivated for cancer research. So that's gonna be the first thing. Um, and we can talk about if you've had some challenges around productivity and things like that, um, how might you deal with that in your application? But 25% is you. 25% is gonna be your mentors. So that's basically how good of a choice did you make when you chose your mentor? So your mentor will also be evaluated on their accomplishments. So how, um, you know, what have they done? And in their area of expertise, how fit are they to be a mentor? Uh, what does their funding look like? The ACS postdoctoral fellowship only provides for your stipend. So somebody's got to pay the, the, the rent money to run your experiments. So is your um, mentor fully funded for the time of the postdoctoral fellowship? Have they mentored anybody else? It's okay if they are a brand new mentor. So I was a young, um, mentor for uh, postdocs, but I had to show that I had brought in other individuals to help mentor my postdocs who had more seniority than I did. And so putting together a mentoring team is just fine. In fact, I would recommend it. Very few of us can get everything we need from one person. Um, but make sure your mentor's CV is updated and, and that they really shine and showcase all the great things that they're doing. The third thing is gonna be the mentoring plan. So the mentoring plan is basically the environment. So where are you gonna be and how is this lab, institution, department gonna help you to transition from being an outstanding postdoc to an outstanding PI? So the mentoring plan should not, number one, be written by you. If it's written by you, the reviewers will be able to tell. And it just really looks bad, right? Because if you have a mentor who's invested in you, the least they can do, is write it down, how they're, what they're gonna do. And honestly, it should be more than, I'm gonna meet with Susanna once a week, I'm gonna send Susanna to a meeting or a virtual conference, yay. All postdocs should be doing that. So what is it about Susanna that is so exceptional that I chose her for my lab? Why is this a good organic fit? And then where are, how, I guess I should say, how am I as the mentor willing and able to use my expertise and success to help Susanna fill some of the voids that she doesn't have in her training so that she can be successful? So what are the career development pieces? I cannot tell you how much time reviewers spend in um, this career development piece and the mentoring plan. Easy. You can be amazing and have a great grant. You could have published six nature papers as a postdoc and grad student and have a research plan that blows them out of the water. If the mentoring plan is terrible, you won't get funded. So 
spend some time on it. All right, uh, last but not least is the research plan. So here it's 25%. So of course it needs to be innovative and exciting. Um, it also needs to be reasonable, right? You're a postdoc, so it the um, grantsmanship is essential here. So meaning that you need to give space and time for failure. So um, those alternative approaches and strategies are really important in a postdoctoral fellowship. And I can't believe I wrote this down, but it's true. We've seen so many grants that aren't focused on cancer. And we're the American Cancer Society. So you shouldn't make your reviewers guess as to how this grant will impact cancer, right? How it's going to move the bar in our mission. Probably you should have the word hypothesis in there more than once, right? So, I mean, these are just basic grantsmanship skills, but they're the skills you develop as a postdoc. So don't use your first submission to develop those skills. Have other people read your grant application and to make sure that it is um, really solid before you submit it. And the other piece is the reasonable piece, right? If you propose a 10-year project for a three-year postdoc, you're not going to get funded. Okay, last thing. The ACS uses lay summaries um, in addition to technical abstracts. Um, those lay summaries are only going to be useful if they are written for someone without a scientific background. Um, the American Cancer Society will assign two scientific um, and or clinical reviewers to your grant and um, one, what we call a stakeholder reviewer, which is someone who has had a significant cancer experience, meaning they are a patient, a survivor, a caregiver, or they have lost someone to cancer. Um, so I cannot emphasize enough that this should be written for someone who doesn't know what you do or care and it needs to blow them out of the water. So it's really important. I've already told you the reviewers are gonna get in the weeds of your grant. They're gonna have a super good time. So just make sure it's a fun experience for them. Don't invite them in with some, you know, just kind of careless mistakes. And the last thing is, and I'm trusting you guys here, even though I can't see you, I'm gonna give you my email address. But I don't want you emailing me the day you get your reviews back because you may not be happy. Sit on them for a while. And then if you wanna email me, fine. Um, or if you wanna email someone on my team, but the biggest piece of advice is the reviewers, even though you may not agree with them, they really are trying to help. Okay, so this is our cycle. So we have a grant deadline coming up in April. That means the peer review will happen in June. We have a second level of peer review called our council, which actually draws the pay line in September and those grants will be funded in January. So I encourage you to apply. Um, the last two things I just wanted to highlight, and then I would love to take some questions, sorry I went all over, is that once you are funded by the ACS, and I think you all will be, we have some amazing experiences for our grantees. One of them I just wanted to show you here is um, you would be invited to join Theory Lab, which is, I'm not on Facebook, but I I think kind of like Facebook for nerds, for kids or nerds. So it's a closed community for ACS grantees and reviewers. And it is amazing because we provide workshops, we provide seminars. Um, it's a way for you to find resources, like if you need a cell line, or if you're really after an animal model, or you have a piece of data you want somebody to look at. It's also a place where uh, we provide funding. Um, we provide TLC grants, um, which are not small, $60,000 grants um, for a new collaboration. Um, so, Fun things happen in Theory Lab. And the last thing I want to give is just a shameless plug for the podcast. Um, would love for you to listen to it and um, you can get to know us a little better. Okay, I think that's it. The last thing I wanted to say, which I should have said at the beginning, is thanks for all you do. We're really grateful. Um, I know you are working extraordinarily hard and that while things are, thank goodness, improving, this is still a hard time to be in science and to be a scientist. So best of luck and um, we'll, we'll do anything we can to help you succeed. Um, and so that is my email address. So I'm sharing that. And again, you'll get these slides later. So I'll stop sharing and I would be more than happy to take any questions. And people can um, type yes. questions into the Q&A module at the bottom of the screen, or you can click the raise hand and we'll unmute you. And it looks like Ilana is um, raising her hand. OK, hi, Ilana. Hi, thank you so much. It was really great presentation. My question is about equity grant. So if my research is focusing at 
uh, younger female cancer survivors, and we are interested to look at ovaries, how chemotherapy affects ovaries, and we are also interested to improve its function. C can it be considered as equity grant or no? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Lana's question is around equity and what do we consider? So my global answer is yes. Um, what I would encourage you to do is to drop me an email and I'll put you in touch with the pro So that, that research would not fall into my program or my team's program, but I can put you in touch with the managers and you'll have an opportunity to kind of run your ideas by them. And I would encourage anybody to do that. Um, but the global answer would be yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Great question. Let's see, looks like there is a question from Luke. Hi, Luke. Um, do most funded postdoctoral ACS grantees have senior mentors? Um, so we'll start with that. If you're a junior PI, would you encourage your eligible postdoc trainees to apply for ACS grants? Yeah, so it's a great question. So I would say no to the first answer. I mean, to the first question, do most uh, postdoctoral ACS grantees have senior mentors? No, not at all. Um, however, you are, because there is a unique benefit, right, to having a young PI in your lab because you're just there more, right? You're on the bench and you're giving that hands-on feedback. Um, the challenge is of course that you're gonna potentially get that or your postdocs when they apply will get that review of the mentor is very junior, right? <laughs> so the way you're exactly right, the way to deal with that is to put together a um, mentoring committee, which I would 100% encourage. In fact, I kind of encourage that for everybody. I don't ever think there's a problem. So where do I see challenges in mentoring committees or where do I see things fall apart? So first of all, you have to have a really solid communication strategy. So if there's a mentoring committee, how, what are you each doing, right? So let's say you, Luke, are the junior PI and you've brought on a senior investigator, why? Is it a particular, do, are they, um, you know, do they have success with the technique or is it more that they're going to give advice around career development? Grant writing, you know, what, what specific purpose are they going to serve? And so I think you need to outline or that postdoc needs to outline the roles of that mentoring committee. And then that needs to happen in two other places. One is in the mentoring plan. You would need to lay out as the PI, this, um, this is an outstanding postdoctoral fellow. I'm so excited to have them in my lab. This these are the things and the ways that I will mentor them, but I recognize that I'm junior. So we've also brought on X, Y, and Z who will provide blah. And then Dr. X, Y, Z um, needs to say that they also think your fellow is amazing and that they are willing to give time and effort and they are contributing blah. So that all three of you have said the same thing. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, and they don't have to be at your institution. That's another thing to think about is that, you know, one thing COVID's taught us is that um, we don't all have to be in the same place to accomplish lots of things together. Just make sure that communication plan is intact. Um, and then let's see, your second question, does having an RSG as a PI have a positive impact on that RSG's grantees? Oh, sure, I mean, that's, um, it's certainly a great thing, right? We've already recognized, um, if someone has a research scholar grant, we've recognized them as being outstanding and exceptional. So I, you know, the other thing to think about when you're applying for a research scholar grant to the ACS is that, um, and I promise I'll loop this back to your question, um, you can have an R01 and then an additional, grant that's up to $300,000 for three, up to three years. So any funding looks good to the ACS, right? Because it shows that continued progression and career development of the PI. So um, whatever funding the PI has looks really good. Yeah, for sure. All right. Is there another hand? Let's see. 
I may need some help from the organizers. I, I can't really see if there's any more um, questions. Oh, uh, just uh, Dr. Lee, I just unmuted you. Uh, hello, I have a question about the research scholar grant. Yeah, sure. So, so the PI should be a tenure track position or any like, you know, junior or PI, like a uh, assistant professor level? Yeah, it's a good question. So tenure track is, I would say in general, what we're looking for. Um, the So however, different institutions label tenure track in different ways. So I, I don't wanna say that you should never apply if you're research track because at some institutions um, that is a tenured or that has a pathway to tenure progression. What, what I will say you can't use this grant for is like the institution can't say if Dr. Greer receives the research scholar grant, she will be made, she will be put on tenure track, right? So that, that kind of goes back to that institutional investment. The ACS reviewers are gonna be looking for individuals the AC, that the um, institution has already invested in and has said, you know, Dr. Lee's amazing and outstanding. Um, we think so, and we also want the ACS to invest. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank sure. You so Let's see. Um, Bache has a question. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your names correctly. Applicants to research scholar grants with an already funded R01, positive, negative. Oh, that's huge. So yeah, um, the if, so if, um, to apply for a research scholar grant, there is some eligibility, which again, jump on cancer.org. There's some beautiful eligibility trees there, but 100% any funding looks great, right? So the goal of the ACS is to fund the most outstanding scientists doing the most outstanding research. So if another organization has already invested in you, so if you have an institutional grant or you have a grant from the NIH, that's great, right? Because that that is going to reduce the um, risk of the ACS investing in you, right? It's kind of the, the same thing as that senior author or corresponding author publication. So it's, it's a deep risk for us. Where you flip to the other side is if you have two R01s, because once you have two R01s, amazing, but we no longer think you need to be launched. But as long as if you have one R01 and you, or, or equivalent grant, you can have that and an additional $300,000 in funding for three years and you're absolutely so eligible. And yeah, it looks really good. What I would be really careful, this isn't what you asked, but since we're here, I would be really careful to spell out the overlap in your, so when you talk about your current or pending funding, and this is for anyone, don't give the reviewers anything to guess about. Go ahead and tell them, these are the aims of either my funded or pending grant, um, this is why either A, so if it's funded, there is zero overlap with the ACS application, or if it's pending, there is overlap, and I would accept on an either or basis, or there's zero overlap, and this is why. So just don't, because they're going to they're gonna look, right? They're going to get on grants.gov and go look. It doesn't matter if you put it or not, but you, you need to go ahead and spell it out so that... Um, and that's very true for post for postdoctoral applicants too. Make sure that you have declared your lack of overlap from your PI's funding. So just spell it out for them. Make it easy. Oh, one thing you can do is when you publish those papers, um, tell the reviewers how those publications um, don't accomplish the aims of the grant, right? Because that's not the goal, but support the aims. And it could be something you might not think of, like a technique that you've published or a collaborator or a, you know, some, some way that this has moved your research forward, even because lots of people will say, well, Susanna, I have a paper, but it's unrelated because I have a different project. Well, of course, we all have two or three or four projects in our lab, but they're probably, I mean, you can find something, some way that this publication has um, enabled this study or impacted this study. I would definitely talk about that. Okay, uh, can you speak to the funding forecast for 21 deadlines for ACS? Um, I asked if submissions during the past 12 months were impacted, yeah. 
Um, speaking as a fellow that received an outstanding score that's now in limbo with the pay if designation. That's a great question. Yeah, so um, the ACS, like all nonprofits, I mean, well, and everybody on the planet was certainly impacted by COVID. Um, so for the first time ever, to my knowledge, we canceled peer review in October of 2020. We did that for a couple of reasons. The first is that we did not know our budget. We had a fundraising campaign that ended at the end of Q4 in 2020, but we weren't going to know the outcome. And it was dedicated to research. We weren't going to know the outcomes, though, of that campaign until um now, basically, 2021. And so we didn't want to waste applicants' time and we didn't want to waste reviewer time. We did review postdoc grants in um, April of 2020 and we reviewed a couple of smaller mechanisms, but for the most part, uh, we had a much smaller peer review. So first, congratulations on the um, PAYF. That is significant. We do find a substantial number of postdoc grants out of that PF category. Um, you can always ask me about that offline. You probably know just as much about it as, as I do, but that is by donor um, discretion. So your question was about pay lines. Um, so we expect our pay lines to get back to where they were pre-pandemic. So we're looking for good pay lines in 2021. Now that's with the noted exception that I don't know how many applications we'll get, uh, but our funding is, is back to because of the enormous efforts by my development colleagues whom I am forever grateful for and the enormous uh, contributions of ACS uh, donors. Um, yeah, 2020 is looking, 2021 is looking much better. 2020 was terrible. So feeling very grateful about that. So submit your grants is my, what I would encourage you to do. Any other questions? I'm happy to take questions or like I said, drop me an email if there's something you'd like to know. I don't wanna ask in front of everybody, that's certainly fine. Okay, well, I guess if there aren't any last questions popping up, um, we can just wrap it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer for uh, excellent con uh, conversation and excellent presentation. I think everybody's going to find the slides especially uh, useful when we send them out later. Absolutely. Well, it's nice to kind of meet you all. Maybe someday I'll get to see you in person. But in the meantime, good luck and um, hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of ACS for uh, being open um, and available to do this. It, it means a lot. So thank you. Absolutely. All right. Look forward to seeing your grants. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.